Welcome to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Fremont Unified School District Superintendent Jim Morris. It's no secret that the biggest challenge facing FUSD is crowded conditions at many of our schools. As a district, we have both a district-wide shortage of classrooms and funding for new school construction. And it's really led to an unfortunate reliance in our district on portable buildings to relieve overcrowding. Currently, we have over 2,000 students who are sent away from their neighborhood school. With the passage of Measure E in 2014, it's assisted in adding some permanent classrooms to some campuses. As Fremont continues to grow, we simply do not have the resources to accommodate new schools arriving at our schoolhouse gates. We need assistance. Possible remedies to the sol or solutions to address overcrowding are an increase in developer fees on the companies building new housing within Fremont. Fremont is one of many school districts attempting to persuade the State Allocation Board to allow districts like Fremont to offer higher developer fees to be able to help us keep up with enrollment growth. Here today to discuss this with us are representatives from Fremont Council PTA and um, Delinka Group, which are our demographers for the school district. I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself, um, starting with Liz. Yes. Um, well, my name is Liz Fisher, and I'm the president of the Fremont Council PTA. We represent 30 units in the Fremont Unified School District. And uh, we've been working as a coalition with the district as well as other agencies and concerned parents uh, to advocate on the issue of developer fees and funding for our schools. And Anne? Hi, my name is Anne Fink, admin. I'm from Delinka Group, and we have been the district's demographer for the last couple years. And so we uh, have been working with your district in particular on your enrollment projections as well as your developer fee calculations. And this is really an issue, I think, um, Liz, that the community has a great interest in. Yes. And uh, can you talk a little bit about why has this become such an important topic across Fremont? Well, I think many residents are seeing those courtesy notices going up around town. And uh, they're experiencing traffic, um, and this in part due to uh, the increased development in Fremont. Uh, and we're seeing about 8,000 plus units coming online here in Fremont. And uh, part of the popularity is our, you know, quality schools. Uh, so uh, we did a survey a few months ago uh, to get a sense of what people think about development. And the responses were overwhelmingly, uh, it's been a lot. Um, the impact to our schools has been great, and uh, we believe that uh, developers should pay more towards the mitigation of, of their developments. It, and I think your point you're making is so important because I, I, I think folks across Freeman are saying, what's the impact on the larger community? Every one of us live in a home that was built by somebody who is developing property in Fremont. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think what we're hearing from the community is not, oh, it's anti-development so much as it is, let's really be smart about looking at the impacts. What's really happening in the community? Um, and if you could maybe jump in here and talk a little bit about what do you see happening with the enrollment in Fremont and, and uh, strategies that, that you use for predicting what that enrollment would be and then advising the district on here's what you guys should be doing about it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. We've performed your own projections for the last couple of years and every year over year it has just grown tremendously. It's been amazing how the enrollment has been unprecedented. Um, what we do is we look at historical birth rates, how many kids are born into the district, as well as how many people are moving in. And year over year, more and more people are moving in and sending their kids to Fremont, which is causing a huge amount of overcrowding. In addition to that, um, just a lot of new developments coming on board too. And so to um, offset that, really the district can do a couple of different things, is to maximize your developer fees, 
um, as well as just really try to push for um, the local support on various voter approval measures. Talk to us a little bit about, if you can just explain at a very basic level, what are these developer fees we're mm -hmm. talking about? Because it's become kind of a buzzword and a hot topic in Fremont. You know, oh, we need to increase developer fees. What are developer fees and how does a school district go about figuring out how much they charge? Absolutely, that's a good question. So developer fees are allowed to be charged by any school district in the state of California. And there's three different levels of developer fees. It's level one, two, and three. And so the state allocation board every two years looks at what the level one fee rate should be. And so a school district in order to charge that level one fee will need to do a justification report to justify charging that fee amount for a residential or commercial industrial property that is building within your district. So any new residential uh, and or commercial industrial property will need to pay a developer fee per square foot to offset the impact they create by bringing new students. Now districts that have high growth or little capacity um, can also charge what's called a level two fee. And a level two fee is a much higher fee typically than a level one fee. And so that is to then even more so offset the impact from the students that will come on board from the new development. And so that's two levels of developer mm -hmm. fees. Is there another level? There is another, le another level, the level three fee, and that is typically double the level two fee amount. And that, um, so far since 1998 when school fee, when these different levels of school fees came about through Senate Bill 50, um, that has never been enacted. Because in order to enact that, the state allocation board needs to then make a finding that all state funding has been exhausted and school districts are then eligible to charge this level three fee amount. And <clears throat> I know, Liz, the parents in our community have been very strong in advocating for level three fees. Can you talk a little bit about how parents in our community have become so educated and become passionate about making the needs of our community known. Yes, well there are those parents of the students that are overloaded that have to go across Fremont uh, in order to get their children to school. Um, and then even in some of our impacted areas uh, in the north of Fremont, um, facilities are having an impact on students on the campus. Um, for instance, uh, at American High School, um, they're very crowded over there. We are, of course, addressing that with some new classrooms. Um, but ultimately, along with classrooms, you need bathrooms and meeting spaces. And students uh, will refrain from drinking water during the course of the day because they can't uh, afford to wait in line to use the restroom. And um, uh, then, you know, school facilities, they get older and they need to be maintained. But, but uh, ultimately, a, a, a new schools are needed. Uh, we need five new elementary schools in our projection for Fremont and uh, a little over one high school <laughs> that we still need here in this um, district. So uh, it's definitely... Uh, an issue with parents. And if you really think about it from the perspective of a parent, um, all of us as parents, you know, you have this um, desire to protect and, and have the best for your children. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, it's fascinating how quickly a parent can become a parent activist when something isn't happening right for their child. And I think mm -hmm. we've seen some of that. Um, I, I think you, you mentioned the 2,000 students, you know, who um, are sent out of their neighborhood school. That's very, it's a tough thing, but from the perspective of a parent, they, they need reassurance that somebody's thinking about what's the impact on a child? What's the impact on a child about with not being able to go to your neighborhood school, being sent across town, getting up a half an hour early, riding in a car across town, um, and then, you know, a year or two later, getting called back, having to figure out a whole different school, many folks move into a community like Fremont because they want stability for their family. There's nothing for children like starting in a classroom with kindergarten, a group of kindergartners, and graduating high school with some of those same children. 
um, it, what process have you and different parent organizations use to just educate parents about what you can do? Well, uh, you have actually visited uh, several of our PTA units to tell them of the situation, and uh, we had you visiting a number of our schools, as well as uh, school board trustees. Um, uh, speaking of ways we can um, uh, advocate for funding, um, and so we, um, hmm, uh, we, we bring it forth at each and every one of our meetings at the council level as well and uh, give them subsequent updates. Um, last month, of course, going to the state allocation board to attend that meeting. Uh, a number of those parents were, were PTA parents um, and ones that um, were made aware of, of this situation through their PTAs. I, I think the most um, real example that, that I can share is this idea that you know, we currently have 100 kindergarten classrooms, capacity 24 to 1 for 2,400 kindergarten students. And we know we already have pre-enrolled for August 2,600 children, <laughs> which tells wow. me, you know, call to Houston, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's the examples like that, that we have to be really good about sharing with the community because what I've seen, when we educate parents and let them know, here's the reason, here's some solutions we're looking at, um, it, it's a good way to help them understand and get on board. One of the things that, that you had mentioned earlier, um, both of you, is this reliance on portable classrooms, you know, putting down rental classrooms. Um, how is that, uh, calculated into the district's developer fees and and is there a limit anywhere on the number of portable classrooms we can just keep putting on and on well there's no limit unfortunately because portable classrooms are used as a method for offsetting growth um, in order to qualify for developer fees though there is a calculation where you have to meet um, and you have to at least have 20 percent of your total classrooms as portable classrooms and so the the reason for that is because a district um, such as yours that have actually 27 percent of your total classrooms as portable classrooms is that you just have done as everything possible to offset the huge amount of growth and so because of that it's a way to then justify charging this level two fee so even though we're we're higher than the 20 20 percent that's not a statistic we should be proud of right <laughs> because if really we were doing right by children we'd have permanent classrooms in the neighborhood where the children live mm -hmm. so um, yeah, we're, we're often uh, a little competitive in Fremont and we want to <laughs> be doing better than any statistic and that's one we, we really need to be embarrassed by. Um, and I think um, as, as uh, Liz mentioned, you know, one of the other solutions, we keep putting these portables down and portables down and portables down and we have at our school's existing infrastructure, multi-use rooms, main offices, health offices, um, restroom facilities for students, cafeterias that just can't accommodate the, the number of children who keep um, just coming and coming and mm -hmm. coming onto those campuses. Uh, the um, uh, idea of charging a higher fee, I know we've had discussions in the past about, well, we believe and many of our parents when we visited the state allocation board I think our message was clear to them that we're, we're really asking you to do what we believe the law requires you to do we believe that since about 2012 you could have adopted this resolution really saying there are no state matching dollars we're, we don't have the money to meet the need and the state allocation board hasn't done that um, any idea on how much money we've lost out on since 2012? Yes, actually it's a sizable sum, uh, in excess of over $11 million. And money like that could have gone towards the uh, building of, a, of another elementary school yeah. 
here in Fremont, which we desperately need. And you, you really think about it, putting in very real terms for us. We know it's costing us about $950,000 for every permanent new classroom that we build in the district. Right, you're right. There's 12 new classrooms. Mm -hmm. The building we just built at, at Warm Springs Elementary could have been paid for, um, but we've really lost out on that opportunity. And I think that's one of the reasons our parents are so... Um, strong in their opinion. Yes, we look forward to potentially a state bond on the horizon in November, and that would be great for us. And we have this immediate problem we need help with. Um, at the state level, Anne, what's the word on the state bond? Well, the state bond hopefully is uh, going on the November ballot, and they're just gathering money right now. The various organizations are gathering money for donations so that um, it could at you know, get support for this $9 million bond. So the $9 billion, or $9 billion, I'm $9 sorry. Billion yes. potential bond, um, helpful to Fremont um, because it would provide money for us. But if the state passed a bond in November, how long would it be? Do you have any guess on how long it would be till money would start to flow? It would be a while because there are so many schools that are on the waiting list right now. So because state funding has been pretty much exhausted over the last couple of years. Um, school districts have just been applying for state funds um, and getting in line for this potential state bond that was originally think, uh, slated for 2014 and now 2016. So Fremont is in line to get state funding, but um, to the extent that um, the bond passes, it would be a while before your district receives any state matching funds. Can you talk a little bit historically about developer fees? Now, we charge in Fremont Unified a level two developer fee. Mm -hmm. um, how often is that developer fee adjusted? And do you have a little bit of a historical perspective? Does it go up? Does it go down? Yeah, so your developer fees in particular are um, have to be adopted every year. Level two fees have to, um, we have to make a finding that you're justified to charge this higher rate every year. So typically, your has made a finding um, at the uh, governing board meeting at, in May of every year. And so your current level two fee is $5.70. And that has gone up or down um, in the last couple of years, mainly because of a number of factors, cost of construction, number of students coming on board, number of residential units. But most of the time it has been an upward trajectory. And in fact, this current year in 2016, we have available for public review a um, new level two report and now the estimated dollar amount, um, if approved by the board, will be $8.19. So that um, increase is dramatic and that's mainly because over the last year, the cost of construction, the cost of the land, to purchase uh, for a new site, and the projected units from the city have just dramatically increased over the last year. So I want you just to highlight those three factors. The fee is, is we anticipate, will be um, approved to increase because cost of land in Fremont, mm -hmm. way up. Mm -hmm. Number of projected units, uh, up. Right. And the number of students coming from those projected units, way up. Absolutely. Just in the last year alone, the student generation rates from the various units that were built in the last five years have increased. And so that is one large factor when calculating level two fees is how many students are coming to your district just in the last five years alone. And so even from a last year to this year, that number has grown. And so, and then on top of the other factors um, also growing, that just caused the level two fee to increase um, from the $5.70 to the $8.19. Now, we've had a lot of conversations about here's what you're allowed to charge and uh, here's what it actually costs to build a school. Mm -hmm. can, can you tell us a little bit about um, what that difference is and why there's a difference? You know, I, I, I mentioned, you know, it's been costing us about $950,000 to build each classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, what we charge in fees doesn't cover that cost. Right. Can you explain a little bit about why? Yeah, it's unfortunate because I think the intention was good back in 1998 when they came up with the formula 
developer fees, especially level two fees, are supposed to met, be meant to cost or to offset 50% of the cost of construction. And unfortunately, as time has passed, the actual cost of construction is much higher than the inputs that are used to calculate level two fees. So I'll give you an example. Part of the level two fee calculation is based on a state grant amount, so the uh, per pupil grant amount for state funding. And they use a construction index to um, calculate that um, grant amount. That construction index doesn't match what you are truly experiencing because that's based off of all of California versus to your district alone. And so the cost of construction just does not match a developer fee rate. So the developer fee that you're charging may only be 30 to 40 percent of the total cost for construction. And on top of that, there's no state funding. And so your district has to then figure out how to pay for the cost of constructing for 60 to 70 percent of a facility on a local level. Uh, and, and, and it seems that the only real solution is really getting parents involved and educated. And, and Liz, I'm going to ask you to close us out today. Just what mm -hmm. advice would you give to a parent who was watching and said, I want to be part of the solution. I want to get educated about this topic and really help to make it better for the children in our community. Okay, well, um, the Department of General Services is where you'll find the Office of Public School Construction site. Uh, they are the ones that host the State Allocation Board. And uh, going to that website, uh, you can find out who those members are and you can contact them. You can phone them, you can email them, and let them know that we would like to see uh, develop level three developer fees enacted, at least for the interim. Um, now, we'll see what happens in the fall, uh, should the bond pass. Um, um, but if it doesn't, uh, it might be time to review how we fund school facilities. And the um, Legislative Analyst's Office uh, put out a report last year in April um, on this topic, and they have several very good suggestions. Um, I would encourage parents to educate themselves on that and uh, talk to their legislator. And I think the last one we would really want our parents to do is talk to the other parents at your school. Get involved Certainly. at the local um, level. You know, attend those PTA meetings. Talk with other parents. And you're right, anybody who wants to have a coffee conversation, community conversation, just call us. And we have folks at the school district who are happy to go out and really work with um, the community. Um, I, I thank you both for joining us today on Community Conversations and really talking about this important issue to the Fremont community. Mm -hmm. From all of us at Community Conversations, I thank you for watching and hope you'll get involved in really learning about how development and enrollment growth is impacting the Fremont School District.